And Matt, over to you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for the intro. So if I flip over to my slides. Uh, hello, I am Matt Collins Jones, uh, and I will be talking about have you replaced all your workflows with Power Automate yet? Uh, the premise and that question is is set to sort of ignite conversations and, and spark discussions, uh, and that's the reason why I wanted to talk about it today. So to kick things off, uh, I wanted to give you a brief overview of who I am, um, just so you're familiar with me uh, in case I've not met you before or the UG events. So I'm Matt Collins Jones. I'm a senior D365 CE consultant. Uh, I work for a company called TSG. I've been working with Dynamics, um, Dynamics CRM, uh, D365 CE, uh, whatever we're calling it these days, uh, for about nine plus years. I actually started from a end user perspective, so probably where a lot of you are now. Uh, I was initially a user of the software, so I used it uh, as customer service software to manage cases and accounts and, and send engineers out to site to repair things. Uh, and then I transitioned into more of a sort of system admin role uh, before transitioning into sort of CRM support specifically and then consultancy. I've worked um, from CRM version 3.0 um, all the way through to uh, the current uh, online versions, uh, and I've worked both on-premise and online. Uh, so I kind of have a, a good grasp of uh, you know all that sort of ecosystem. I'm a D365 UG Northwest committee member. Um, so me and a couple of other people put on uh, UGs in the Northwest, specifically in Manchester. Um, so if you're ever in the neighborhood and you're not on lockdown, you can feel free to stop by and see one of our meetings. Um, I've got 14 exam passes across the Dynamics uh, and Power Platform uh, ecosystem. Uh, exams are another thing that I'm actually really passionate about, uh, as well as Power Automate. So I like to take a lot of those. Uh, and I'm also a cat dad as well. So that is Miso on the left, and that is Ted on the right. Uh, Ted is our new baby kitten. But <laughs> to, uh, to start with what we're, uh, we're talking about today, this is the agenda that we're going to be talking about today. So we're going to talk about the purpose of this presentation. We're going to talk about uh, a slight history lesson. Um, I'm going to go through the feature uh, capability comparison between the two uh, platforms. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a demo. This is not really a demo heavy um, session. This is more um, of a, a business perspective of why you should be changing to Power Automate now uh, and, and no longer building uh, classic workflows. Um, so this is not sort of um, demo heavy. It's not designed to teach you how to use Power Automate. It's, it's designed to, choose, to spark that discussion about whether you should be moving to that platform right now. And I have a quick summary at the end as well. So, purpose of this de of this talk today. Um, the purpose is to convince you to never build another classic workflow. So the workflows that you know inside a D365 or the workflows you know inside of a CDS. The purpose of this is to make sure you never build another one of those after today, where reasonably possible. So I gave a variation of this talk back in October at D365 UG Focus uh, in Brussels. And I said on that stage that I was never going to build another classic workflow after that day. And I can hand on heart tell you, I've not built another classic workflow after that session, except when I've worked with on-premise customers. So on-premise, sometimes you don't always have the luxury of the on-premise data gateway to, um, to be able to connect to services such as Power Automate. You still have to use classic workflows there or use plugins there. Um, what I've done outside of the on-premise work, so all the online customers, is I have solely built um, Power Automate flows and I've also um, reworked some existing classic workflows into uh, flows, so using Power Automate, and that is the purpose of this this talk, and that's to start this start this discussion, start this initiative of moving everyone away from classic workflows. So we'll start off with a little history lesson. So I'll tell you the history of classic workflows. So classic workflows were actually introduced in CRM 3.0. 
Um, they were originally asynchronous only or background workflows. Um, I don't know sure if people actually have uh, much of a history of Dynamics or, or of the Dynamics platform, but when Microsoft were releasing Dynamics, they released version one, um, and then they started to build version two. And version two was originally planned uh, or called Project Green. The idea being is they were going to take the code base for CRM, for NAV, for GP, and try and combine it all into a single code base and a single um, you know, data model that could be expanded uh, expanded upon. And we kind of we are we are starting to see that a little bit more now with the CDS 2.0 being released um, and the dual rights that are coming to FNO and, and CE together. So it's kind of we are starting to get there. But version two, which was 15, 16 years ago, uh, when it was planned to come out, um, that's when they initially had these ideas. Um, and and these workflows are kind of built out of that where they wanted to synchronize things, they wanted to automate your processes uh, before that it wasn't really something that was available to end users. We also had the introduction of synchronous workflows, so real-time workflows in 2013. So um, it's about seven years ago now when those were introduced, um, but since then there's not really been much in the way of new um, new things that have come out of uh, out of development for workflows. Um, we, you know, we we can now trigger them from business process flows, uh, but that's about it. There's not really been much investment in workflows since that time. Um, also, in 2013, was the introduction of actions as well. So actions were a new thing. Um, but you can kind of see how the landscape has kind of changed over the last sort of like seven years and the direction that Microsoft to try and push everyone in. So with that, history of flow, oh, I mean Power Automate. So um, Power Automate is the new name for what was previously known as Microsoft Flow. Uh, Microsoft Flow was released into GA on October 31st, 2016. Um, it, come, it came after, it came from the birth of Logic Apps. So Logic Apps uh, were released at the end of July, 2016. Uh, and Logic Apps are kind of the more developer, heavy developer end to uh, what is now um, Power Automate, which was previously Microsoft Flow. Uh, and there is a, a sort of a parity between the two products, as in um, Microsoft, uh, Power Automate is that newer sort of style user interface. It's a lot easier for people to use. Um, but if you want to try and um, you know do those continuous developments, those pipeline um, deployment sort of things through um, Azure DevOps, Logic Apps is a much more natural um, progression for that rather than Power Automate. The reason why Power Automate was actually created in the first place is that the project lead or the pro uh, product manager, Steven Siciliano, um, actually said in an interview that they were building logic apps and they realized that, that automation is something that everyone should be able to do, not just developers. So that's why they brought this front end and they made Power Automate um, off the back of logic apps because they believed that it was something that everyone should be able to do. And that's what we're trying to see today is that these, you know, the Power Automate flows is kind of a, it's a step up from classic workflows. It's that whole idea of pushing things forward and connecting to multiple things and doing automation. Um, there are a couple, of, a couple of things you need to be aware of, but it's the whole idea that everyone should be able to do this. Everyone should be able to make their life easier and their life better with, um, with, with automation. Um, there's 340 connectors uh, currently available. Um, I got this number because I have a flow that goes off and just counts the number of connectors available. Um, this is something that Microsoft keep pushing uh, a lot because they want to talk about the fact that you don't just need to connect to one service, you can connect to any service. And it's not even that you can only connect to the ones that are currently available. If you have a data source, if it has an API that you can call, you can create your own connector or you can just use Power Automate to go off and do an API request and pull that information back. So it's not, we're not looking at this in terms of the concept of just inside CDS and replacing that. Yes, that's, or Dynamics 365. Yes, that's kind of the purpose of this, but there is so much more that you can do rather than just um, you know, when someone clicks a button, you create an email and sends to a, an end user. You can do so much more with this platform now. 
Uh, and we also had um, the release of robotic process automation. So uh, what's called UI flows, uh, the ability to sort of like, you know, scrape data from a screen, um, use that data and then trigger applications um, autonomously um, that you can then do things. So if anyone was in the last talk with Chris Huntingford, he started talking about um, the, the use cases for this. Um, using legacy systems and using uh, you know data and pulling that into uh, legacy systems to then do something with that. Um, that went into GA April um, this year, so like this month actually. Um, and it's a fantastic tool uh, if you get a chance to check it out uh, and if you have that need for it. Uh, it is designed for those systems where you just can't get away from those legacy systems uh, or you just don't have that capacity to do it right now. You can still bring in that automation and those data connections albeit from a different perspective and that's the uh, that's the key thing there so with that that is my history lesson uh, i'm just going to double check in the chat to see if you have any uh, questions we don't that's good because i was just talking about history so far um, and hopefully that's all good so i'm going to move on to uh, the feature comparison uh, between these platforms so this is a variation of a table that is actually on the microsoft docs website um, i have updated it slightly but what i want to do is i want to talk through through each one of these and show you what we can and can't do uh, at the moment with Power Automate compared to classic workflows. So where each one of these, we have the Power Automate symbol here. Uh, we also have the, the process icon here uh, denoting where these things are available. So the first one being conditional branching. Uh, this is something that we get into the habit of, um, or at least people that use those practices, get into the habit of doing at the start of each workflow. Start a flow, run a check condition to make sure um, you know we're doing something. Um, that is how I used to build classic workflows, uh, but conditional branching as well as uh, parallel branching, which is a bit further down, and switch all allow you to do so much more um, inside of Power Automate than you previously had the ability to do in classic workflows. So conditional branching is is a is a tie, but um, there is a lot more power inside of uh, Power Automate. Looping, um, so looping through records and running over multiple records. Previously, you'd need to use a tool. So I think like, you know, the XRM toolbox could do things about triggering fields and triggering, um, you know, multiple things to then run a workflow. Uh, I know my company had created a, a program to automatically run uh, workflows um, throughout the night where we need hundreds or, you know, maybe thousands of workflows to run. Um, the looping ability allows you to actually run those things but instead of running thousands of flows, you just run a single flow and you loop through hundreds of records or thousands of records. So you can do that looping, uh, multi, you know, updating sort of 10 records from a single run of a flow, making it much more efficient because you're only doing that pull of data once and you're not, um, you know, queuing up jobs in your asynchronous, um, you know, backlog to try and, uh, you know, get these through. And this is not available in classic workflows. Uh, wait conditions on fields. So there is not the ability to wait until a field equals a certain thing in Power Automate at the moment that is available in classic workflows. So that's one for classic workflows. Parallel branches. Uh, parallel branches are a fantastic tool. They allow you to go down multiple branches at the same time. So you can do one action and then do another action and then do another action um, all simultaneously. Um, no uh, conditions about whether something's going to um, fail or not. It's just going to run through each parallel branch and get to the end of it. Um, that's not available in classic workflows. Uh, and we also have this out of the box connectors to external systems. So triggers and perform actions on external services. So as I said at the start, there are 340 different data connectors. Each one have different triggers. They have different actions. You can also make custom ones. You can design um, you know, your data to be connected to everything, uh, connected to 
anything you know with a with a connector and with an endpoint that you can hit. So the whole point of this is that you no longer have to think of just inside of CDS or just inside of Dynamics. If you need something to trigger from your Business Central system or your Nav system uh, to then update something in your Dynamics system, you can do that. If you need something, um, you know, connecting and creating some SharePoint lists like uh, or some SharePoint document libraries, uh, Ryan McLean did a great talk earlier today on um, you know using Power Automate to create um, SharePoint collections and document libraries and things like that. Um, that's the ability you have here, which you don't have in classic workflows. So that's another another point for Power Automate there. I'm going to switch over to features uh, features composition. So um, actually composing your your workflows or your flows, um, you do still have dynamic content in both. So you can make um, you, you can use content from uh, records that are triggering things in Flow. You can use um, classic workflows can look up uh, data from related entities. Um, the the only thing about this example is actually the the power automate one is a lot more powerful than the classic workflow one so although these these things are tied on my table um the dynamic content for power automate is actually a lot more powerful because with classic workflows you can only look at the related entity from where you are so you can go off and you can look at um you know if you're looking on an account you can look at or you're looking at a contact, you can look at an account and get some details from the account. But what you could also do is um, with Power Automate is you could look at the account and then you could look at all um, opportunities that relate to that account that are not necessarily related to that contact. And you could bring through a list of those and you can use the dynamic content from those in your flows. So though that's kind of a draw um, in terms of an, an actual feature, there is still more power in Power Automate than there is in classic workflows. Access to pre-image of event data. I didn't really understand this one uh, very much. I saw it on the table, so I went off and did a bit of research, but this is the idea of having access to data before something is run. So you do get that with classic workflows and you don't get that with Power Automate. Run child workflows. This is one that I updated myself um, because the table on the website uh, on Microsoft Docs is a little out of date at the moment. Um, running of child workflows is currently available in Power Automate and is available in uh, classic workflows as well. This is the ability to actually run another workflow triggered off the back of your or another flow triggered off the back of your flow. So especially if you need to um, source jobs out um, to maybe you know loop through a bunch of records and stuff like that, um, or do a certain action and break things down to be simpler, that's what you can do with this, as opposed to having a flow that is sort of like you know you, you scroll down the screen for ten minutes until you hit the bottom of it. That's the point of that one, um, and it's been available in uh, classic workflows for a long time. Run common data service actions, including customs. So actions are the ability to do a specific thing. So in terms of dynamics, you have things like the qualified lead action. So when you qualify lead, it automatically creates a contact, a uh, an account, and a opportunity. Now you can configure that as an action and replace the the out of the box thing with that. And it, what it'll do is you can specify whether you are um, suppressing duplicates, whether you are not going to create an opportunity, whether you're going to do something else. So actions are the ability to do specific things inside of Dynamics or inside of CDS that allow you to um, you know call this custom action that does a specific thing. This is now available in Power Automate. Uh, again, uh, it's available in, in um, CDS and Dynamics previously, but it's now available in Power Automate. Uh, that also includes custom workflow actions as well. So again, if you have some C-sharp code um, to perform a specific action that's not available out of the box, you can now call that from Power Automate as well. Um, and that's the, the next point, the run custom workflow activities. So again, if you want to run um, custom workflow steps uh, that you build yourself, you can include them now in Power Automate, which was previously um, only available in classic workflows. So that was an update. I I think it was released late last year, um, so that's why some people haven't uh, haven't made aware of it. Uh, you can group steps to run in a transaction. Um, so this is a new 
action inside the CDS called, um, oh, sorry, this is actually run steps in a transaction. Um, this is um, where you can group things together to make things easier to see. Uh, I don't think this is the change set request one. I think that's the next one. Uh, but just to talk about it anyway, change set request is a new action in CDS, which allows you to um, do your CRUD actions, so your create updates and deletes. Um, and you can um, group those together and if one of those actions fails it'll roll back that whole transaction so it's what developers use a lot in terms of not wanting to create erroneous records or, or run erroneous things uh, you now have that ability in power automate uh, which you don't really have in classic workflows but i think this is actually about grouping that's the next bit uh, and approval workflows so one of the things out of the box is that there is an approvals engine for power automate so you can set up an approval you can send it off to one or multiple people uh, and you can use that to approve something. So you could approve holidays, you can approve expenses, you could approve um, quotes and quote discounts and things like that if you're using Dynamics. Uh, you can approve engineers going to site if that's just something that you need to do. Power Automate has that built in and it sends a really nice uh, adaptive card, I think it is, to in the email inbox. You can also hook it into Teams and use adaptive cards in there. Um, that's not there in classic workflows. I've kind of put an X and a, and a classic workflow symbol in there because I have actually built on several occasions approval engines inside of uh, inside classic workflows. And the previous demo I did to this, um, I actually showed the difference between the two. Um, but if you have it uh, by default in Power Automate, then why would you really need to build it inside of, uh, you know, CDS as well? And with that, I'm actually going to check to see if we have any questions so far. No questions, so either no one's got any questions. Oh, uh, uh, what's the, oh, we do have a question from Shane Brown, that name sounds familiar. Uh, what's the workaround on Power Automate for the weight on fields? Uh, there isn't really a workaround at the moment. There are triggers that allow you to specifically um, only trigger when a field is a certain thing so you can trigger it on a field and then trigger it when a field equals a certain thing but there's not a wait until that um wait until that has data or wait until that has a certain piece of data but there are ways around that in terms of you can add delays into your um into your flows i think flows can delay up to 28 days um so you can put delays into there and check periodically um and allow it to kind of rerun and reloop but it's not the best. Uh, I will come on to something about that um, in a little while, though. So, um, but yeah, if you do have any questions, just pop into the chat and I'll try and. Oh, here we go. Can we send out the box uh, emails using templates? Um, no, not really. What you can do is you can create um, your template again inside Power Automate. Um, you can um, put all your direct content in there. You can even pull data from records that you wouldn't previously had um, inside of Power Automate and then use that to send emails out. Um, you can even have them still tracked against Dynamics as well. Um, so you can still see the emails going out, um, but you can't you know, call a template from inside Dynamics and use that in a flow. You kind of have to rebuild it. But the interface is so easy that it shouldn't take too long. And you can still do your stuff of embedding images and everything else that you, that you like to do. Uh, oh, another one. Uh, can you see which PA flow has rung against individual entity records in Dynamics, i.e. the scenario I'm trying to, trying to troubleshoot why flow hasn't run or failed given the expected record results against the record? Um, not at the moment. You can kind of see inside of a flow um, if a flow has uh, a run, but then you need to dig into the record and you need to look at that specifically. You can um, you can do things like write into certain fields, um, and you can see your um, your audit log things being updated but you can't see if a flow has actually run on a record like you used to be able to when you kept the workflow logs. But I think with the fact that Microsoft want to move away from um, workflows, it's just sort of to the end, um, that's something that will probably be a bit more available. So, right, I will switch back to my slides and keep going. Um, so, execution. Um, so, 
this is in the context of how flows uh, and power automate can uh, and, and classic workflows can execute so we do have trigger on field changes so as i kind of mentioned uh, when i was answering that question you can trigger on a field changing um that's something that's available inside power automate um, especially for cds you can specify the, the specific field changing and also that one underneath um, you can actually do it where it hits traditional data so we do have uh, an x next to that that second one um, for classic workflows i said one of the one of the things that i did uh, and i know people like justin zars has mentioned it in his podcast and his two minute tuesdays is the first thing that i used to do is put a check condition in after you run the after you won't run the workflow to make sure it's going to run under the same under the right thing the problem with that is that you're then triggering the workflow and it's triggering and then stopping it's triggering it's stopping so that can add especially if, if you have a larger organization that can add um so much performance uh so many performance issues and performance issues to your database and your um your servers try to run all these all these async requests um heaven for this synchronous requests but it can it can cause those problems whereas with power automate what those what those trigger conditions actually do is it just does not trigger the flow so it'll poll periodically um but it just won't trigger it if it doesn't ma match that criteria and that's where uh, power automate comes out a little bit on top of that um trigger on multiple common data service entity events uh yep you can trigger on multiple um flows um, there is a new trigger inside of the cds current environment connector for on create update or delete and it allows you to do any combination of those three things so um, on create of a, a record on create an update on create update and delete on create and delete on update and delete on create an update i think i did that one and on delete and on update and on create only so it allows you to do it on basically any combination that you want um, that is now available uh, again I think it's another thing that's not in that documentation uh, but it is now there um, there is a comment on that documentation to, to actually be updated but it's just not been actioned yet uh, and it's the same thing for um, for uh, classic workflows we do have that selector of um, where do you want this to run um, but again power automate allows you to do uh, a little bit more customization there run on demand uh, available in power automate and available in um and available in classic workflows so uh, that's that's fantastic we can run on demand flows the only thing to kind of put caveat on that is there are currently there are currently three dynamics 365 connectors so there's a d365 connector which will be deprecated uh, and should not be used and there is two cds connectors so there's a, this the common data service connector and there's a common data service current environment connector and that one is only available when you create a flow from inside a solution the common data service current environment connector the only trigger you have on that is when you create update or delete a record whereas on the um, the other connector you do actually have when a record is selected and that is the one that allows you to run on demand flows um, you can still use that connector inside a solution for your deployments but it's just to be aware that there still are a couple of slight differences in those connectors and you need to try and play around with or research what you're doing and, and which connector you need to use uh, Sarah Lager Twist has a great uh, a great blog on this. Um, I also have a great YouTube video uh, that talked about this uh, as well. Uh, run as scopes. So um, as as because most of us are probably from this D365 or this CDS background, uh, the ability to run uh, from an organization, a business unit, or a user's perspective is very important. That is absolutely available inside of Power Automate as well as inside Classic Workflows. Um, so you can do that now uh, as well. Um, there is also now the ability to configure uh, who the flow runs as. Um, so although it runs in the context of the business organization, you can now configure it to run as the triggering user, run as the owner of the, the flow, et cetera. Um, so again, going back to that question about whether you can see whether the flows run, you can actually have it trigger in the contents of that flow user. Uh, and therefore you can, um, you can see if uh, that flow users update that record. Uh, run on a schedule. Um, you know, there's an X next to the classic workflows. I know it's kind of a, a bit, you know, a bone of contention there. Um, people have made scheduling engines inside of Dynamics and they work to varying degrees. However, Flow actually has a scheduling engine by default and it's literally like add an action of like trigger on a schedule, 
configure it to run every day, every week on a Tuesday at 10 a.m. Um, and it'll do that. So that's that's easy. Um, and then we come across the one that I think everyone that I speak to and everyone that I talk to about converting to Power Automate usually brings up with me is um, run synchronously. So no, Power Automate does not run synchronously. Uh, classic workflows do, so there is no real-time aspect. You cannot stop a user from doing something and then roll back that transaction that is only currently available in classic workflows. So that's another uh, tick in the classic workflow box there. Um, and the other thing uh, I want to talk about is, is audits. So we'll do audits and we'll do the next bit and then we'll check for questions. Uh, and then I'm aware that it is three o'clock, so we'll, we'll crack on. So auditing, so there is auditing to see who's changed things for Power Automate. There's auditing to see um, who's changed things for classic workflows. And there's also run analytics, so you can see how well your uh, flows are running. So that's not just like if a flow runs or how many runs it is, it's how, how well it's doing, how, you know, if it's dropping any connections, things like that, that data is available inside of Power Automate. Uh, and we also have um, authoring uh, and portability. So um, Power Automate now, now include, is now included in solutions, so you can use it inside a solution. Um, same as Classic Workflows. There is a modern designer for Power Automate, uh, which you do not get for Classic Workflows. That is still the old designer, which uh, I, I don't think has changed since version, uh, version 2011 at least, uh, maybe previous to that. Um, and there's also AI assisted authoring. So it will try and help you um, loop through things and uh, you know creating um, loops on things where it knows loops are needed. Um, it's a really handy thing. Now, of all these things that I've said in all these slides, I'm just gonna flip back through them. The points that are the X's for Power Automate, so the things that aren't available in Power Automate. All of these, all of these things that are not available except for the run synchronously. These are all in the pipeline and are coming soon. So every single thing that I've said negatively about Power Automate in terms of this is actually going to be available in the future. So if you're saying, well, this, this doesn't have feature parity, other than the synchronous thing, um, everything does have um, does have parity. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't use that as an excuse anymore. Uh, I'm just going to double check questions. Uh, do, 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 okay, so uh, uh, what questions have we got? Uh, in Dynasty, users could create their own workflows and admins could see them. Will uh, this still be the case for flows? There, there is an admin sensor. You can um, you can monitor people's permissions for automating things, and you can also see the data that they're doing. Um, I think there was a video released recently by Laskowitz that actually shows you uh, the data loss prevention um, stuff. So you can actually block connections to different data sources as well, especially if you're worried about people taking stuff out. So yes, absolutely, you can you can do that. And uh, the visibility of them, I'm not 100% sure on, um, but you can definitely, um, definitely um, allow users to do it and also block or limit their connections. Um, what's the ETN deprecating classic workflows? Uh, don't know. <laughs> Ask someone at Microsoft. Uh, I'm not in the know. Uh, I don't think there's an official date, as Matt says. Uh, have Microsoft released any documentation on the transition over? They have. They have a lot of documentation on building flow. There is so much information out there on building flows. Um, so absolutely, there is a great, great ways to do that. Um, there's another question, uh, but I'm going to ignore it uh, because I'm going to go into the next slide and talk about it. Um, so why should I change? Microsoft haven't told me that I should. So this is the thing is that until Microsoft say, we're going to do this, we're going to deprecate something, people go, well, I'm just not going to change because why should I change now? So why should I change? Microsoft haven't told me yet, haven't they? Um, I mean, we've got this one, replace workflows with flow. Uh, that's the Microsoft Docs site. Um, this one came out the other day. Uh, turbocharge your model-driven apps by transitioning away from synchronous requests. So that is actually specifically saying, do not use synchronous requests. That's not even just workflows. They That article talks about um, plugins as well. The reason why plugins shouldn't use synchronous requests. The biggest 
problem in terms of performance of any organization that Microsoft have found is synchronous requests. So that's why they're trying to transition people away from it. Inside the application, you actually see it says uh, we recommend using Microsoft Flow instead of a background workflow. So even the application is telling you now you should be moving away from it. Matt Barber, uh, senior uh, Dynamics, um, you know, uh, person. Uh, I don't know his official job role. Uh, he says we think we've closed the gaps between Flow and classic asynchronous workflows. If you find something missing, let us know. And that was in Stream 365 last year. So Microsoft are even actively talking about the fact that you know the gap now between synchronous, between asynchronous and, and Power Automate is closed and if there isn't then you should tell microsoft um, and what about synchronous flows so again this is from one of the docs sites and it said you should reevaluate whether you need to use synchronous flows or not because um, that is the thing that causes the most performance issues so I, I had a conversation with a colleague of mine just recently and he said um, what is what, what do you use for synchronous flows and i said i, I don't He's like, well, what if you want to show a customer something happening really, really quickly? I said, like, if it takes five seconds or if it takes 30 seconds, the customer's not going to care. It's all about, you know, how we build this and how we, we, we present it to a customer. Um, there shouldn't be any reason why you need to use a synchronous flow. Um, I, know, I know we do still use synchronous things for, for specific things, but Microsoft wants to get you away from the idea of using synchronous and wants to get you onto uh, using, um, uh, using Power Automate. So uh, I realize that I'm starting to run out of time, so I'll quickly do a quick demo. Um, and this demo is going to be uh, data data agnostic, so uh, I'm going to quickly run through this. Um, these are some of the hidden gems that I found in Power Automate. Um, they're not specifically about dynamics. Uh, there's loads of stuff about that, but these are things that are really handy for basically anyone. Um, so the first thing is manual triggers. So you can trigger a flow uh, by a manual trigger. Uh, it's a fantastic thing. I use it all the time for testing. You can just trigger it, um, and you can also add in um, different fields that you want people to fill out. So you can have these things actually run on um, that actually run on a, a mobile phone, a mobile client, or run in, in browser and ask you these questions. And when you when you put this data in, um, you can then pull it out and do things with it. So you could have something that triggers this to say, um, yes, no, um, I'm not feeling very well today and I'll work from home today. I know it's something a little less uh, than, than we need these days, but um, you can you can add in all these things. There's stuff about email addresses with email validation. There's number validation. There's date. You can add attachments. You can add all these into into a manual flow and then use those outputs. So that's a really handy tool that you get uh, with Power Automate. Um, the next one is Scope. So this is one thing that I kind of alluded to earlier is that you can um, you can group things together inside of a flow. Um, so you can have all these things inside a single stroke. So I've got listing some records, sending a mobile notification, creating a compose action, sending an email, um, getting the current time, sending a Teams message and getting all the forecast. I can have that inside a single block that allows me to easily and quickly read my flow. Has anyone ever opened a workflow and gone, how meant, how long is this workflow? I can't understand what bit does where and where I need to look. You can group them into scopes and each scope can have a different name and you can name it something that the person that comes after you can then uh, read and understand. So scopes are a fantastic, uh, fantastic tool to use. Copy and paste. Uh, how many people have wished that they had copy and paste in a workflow? Me. I really wished I had copy and paste in the workflow. The amount of times I've had to redo the same, the absolute same thing, and change a single like line or a single, um, you know, option set, is just it just drives me bonkers. Um, so what you can do in this is you can copy and paste things. So you can click on things, you can click copy to clipboard, which is still in preview. Click on new step and then go to my clipboard and then you have that exact same action with a slightly different name and you can run things in there. So it's fantastic. And you can copy scope. So this scope has four things in it. I can copy this and I can paste this down here 
and all those four things are copied as well and each one of these has a new name um, and I can go in and update it. So this is going to make your life so much easier. I've spent hours and hours of my life building workflows um, so this is incredible uh, and again I'm, I'm trying to looking at this as data agnostic because that's what the whole power platform is it's data agnostic it doesn't matter where your data is it's all about the tools to automate things or to give you user interface or to do your business intelligence but this all this stuff applies to cds as well or dynamics uh, configure run after oh, this is a great tool so uh, configure run after means that you can actually configure things to run um, after the previous step. So um, what we have in workflows is that if you're going down a certain path and something fails, then that's the end of your workflow. It's, it's fallen over, it's failed. Um, so what this allows you to do is if an action is going to fail, you can actually specify whether you want the workflow to continue on or you want the flow to continue on. So if you click into the ellipsis, configure run after, you have these steps. You can say, if this has been successful, trigger it. If it's failed, trigger it. If it's skipped, trigger it. If it's timed out, trigger it. Um, but you can you can change these. So if it doesn't, so if it doesn't pass, um, you can still have this next bit run, and that's what this allows you to do. So in this example, which I'll just trigger uh, quickly, um, what I'm doing is I'm putting this input from this manual trigger in here after um, after this action. Um, but I'm not going to put an input in it and this bit and this is going to fail, but this will still continue on. So if I hit test and I just trigger it really quickly. It knows I'm uh, scraping for time. So if I don't put anything in there, it's going to run. This compose action is going to fail. We can see it fails here. Um, but this follow on action still continues and runs. That's something we've never had before and that's that gives you so much more power and so many more capabilities. Um, the last thing I'm going to tell you about is date diff, and then I'll get on to all your questions. Um, so there isn't actually um, a date diff inside of um, Power Automate, but what it does allow you to do is it uses something called ticks. So if I try and open this up. So a tick, I had to look this up, a tick is 100 nanoseconds from the 1st of January um, 16.01 at midnight UTC, which is very specific. And you think I'm never going to use that, but actually you can because we know exactly how long um, a day is in, nano, in 100 nanosecond increments. Uh, and we know those two differences. We can actually use ticks and you can take one away from the other um, and divide it by the number of minutes in a, in a, in a day. Um, therefore, you can get um, you can get the the number of uh, you know how many days it's been or how many weeks it's been or how many years it's been so in this one it may look horribly complicated and you kind of start from the inside out so we go ticks at utc now so what is the date now we re we subtract that from um whatever date we put in the first bit and then we divide it by 864 uh, billion which is the number of um 100 nanoseconds in a single day and um, what that allows me to do, if I test this out, I can put a date in here. So I can get this date from anywhere. So I can say, I don't know, uh, Thursday. I can hit run the flow, click done. And what that's going to output is that's going to output the number of days between those two things. So although it's confusing, uh, it's actually really simple. Um, I've got examples of this on my website and stuff that you can look at. Um, but yeah, it does that. And you can actually use the same thing for years as well. So I, I did the same formula for years, um, which is really, uh, really cool. And you can uh, use age and stuff like that. So it's fantastic. I use it all the time, um, but uh, it's just knowing what you don't know. So there's no official date diff, but you can use date diff in here. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to flick over to my slides. I know I kind of ran through the hidden demos, hidden gems thing a little quickly, but I wanted to make sure we had enough time for questions. So these are all my uh, contact details. Uh, you can connect with me on Twitter. Um, I've got my blog there, which I post articles to, uh, LinkedIn and YouTube. I currently release a video every single day on YouTube. Um, I have done for, uh, we're coming up on six months of full videos. So there's over 170 videos now, uh, mostly about Power Automate. Um, so it's a great jumping off point. Uh, this is the shameless self-promotion bit of this, <laughs> this talk. Um, 
so you can you can start to learn and start to uh, dig in deep. I do have some stuff on um, on on D three six five and the the wave one stuff and some trust and things. It's mainly on Power Automate though. So, and there's my email. Uh, this is uh, my LinkedIn uh, QR code, and we also have the QR code for the feedback. And any feedback would be appreciated. So with that, I'm just trying to check to see if we've got any questions. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to just uh, shout out as well. Um, can you copy between flows or within a single flow? Yes, you can copy between flows. Um, absolutely. If I go uh, off screen, uh, if I go back into here and hit new step under its clipboard, I have those two things from my previous, from the other flow. So this one over here. Um, but I have that available in any other flows. That is super cool. Um, it does wipe your clipboard, I think, when you close the browser. So you do need to be aware of that. Um, but uh, absolutely, you can do that uh, with Power Automate. Um, I think Matt's saying something about connectors. Uh, it may be you need to recreate the connector. Um, and you may also need to be in the same environment. But um, other than that, uh, it's all good. Uh, I use stroke to bulk actions, but also use run after if error message sends. Uh, okay. Uh, I had no idea about ticks. Yeah, ticks is super cool, but it's really hard to get your head around um, the fact that you're trying to count things in 100 nanosecond increments. So it doesn't really um, uh, it doesn't really um, compute very well, but it's an easy thing to use as long as you know that the thing you have to divide by is nanosecond increments. I did a great blog post on showing how to calculate someone's age as a full number. And what I do is I paste in the date of birth um, from Dynamics, uh, and then I run through and calculate it as a whole number. So, you know, um, if you've used workflows or, um, or business rules in the past to calculate someone's age, it doesn't always work very well because business rules, you have to open the page, uh, workflows, you need to trigger the workflow. Um, I can use Power Automate to run on a schedule um, and check to see whether it's today's date is the same as the birth date. And then you can um, you can actually run through that and calculate someone's age as a full number. Um, so someone is not 14.9679234, you know, uh, they're actually 17 or then they're 18 or then they're 19. So uh, it's absolutely, uh, absolutely right. Um, uh, do you recap uh, regards the portabilities of Power Automate requires environments to be specified? How uh, how does it learn the new environment production name? That's a fantastic question. Um, the CDS connector specifically, there is a current environment connector. So what that means is that if you are migrating that from one environment to another environment, you don't have to go in and re-add that connector into um, Power Automate. It just automatically um, knows what your environment is and it uses the current one. If you don't use the CDS current environment connector and use the other CDS environment connector, there's a drop down for environment. You can choose current or you can specify an environment. So especially if you're trying to get things from um, other environments, so maybe you have like a prod and a, a UART and a, a test system and you actually need to pull things from maybe like a, a data store somewhere, you can actually specify that. Um, there are other ways to do it as well. Uh, environment variables are a thing that are either here or about to be here. Um, I know you can use environment variables in CDS, but I don't know whether they're currently available in Power Automate to use as dynamic content. Um, but if oh, Megan says they are, so they are. Uh, thank you, Megan. Uh, you can absolutely use them, so then you can specify uh, the environment that you're looking at. Um, so there are actually loads of different ways to handle that. Um, so that's from a kind of a dynamic standpoint. Um, in terms of other environments, if you're talking about multiple SharePoints or stuff, uh, other things, you may just need to use custom values when you're specifying, specifying where you're connecting to. Um, oh, yeah, there was a question about the share, share record via a flow, uh, which I think Matt and Ryan have answered. Um, yeah, I saw Ryan do this earlier. Uh, there is a grant access action inside of um, Flow, which is an unbound action uh, inside of CDS, which is an unbound action you can call. Um, and you can still also create all your custom actions yourself as well. So either C sharp plugins or um, just custom logic in your actions, you can absolutely use those and you can um, call them from Power Automate now as well. So I've done that because there is an action for send email. So previously you used to do a um, used to do a trick with the email router where you'd put an email in like a pending send state. 
email route would poll and then send an email. Uh, that's not really uh, worked since we moved to sync server side sync. So um, there is actually an action for send email. You can call that. So you can create an email record inside of the CDS, uh, which means it's there. And then you call the action. It sends it out to the customer. It's tracked into CDS and it's the record you're using and record you're sync, um, checking it against. And um, it'll also go out by the user's mailbox, meaning that um, any replies will come straight back into CDS as well as the mailbox as well, so it's great. Uh, is there a user-friendly way to define check conditions uh, like the advanced find query UI available in classic workflows? Uh, I'm not too sure what you mean by that, Chris. Uh, if you want to pop off mute, I'm happy to uh, try and answer that. Uh, I'm aware that we we uh, the next session starts in 10 minutes, though, so Tricia, if you need to stop me, just... Uh, <laughs> Just uh, bully your way into uh, my non-stop talking. Hi, Matt. This is Farouk. Uh, Chris was asking the question for me because the chat's oh. not open for me for some reason. Oh, right. Okay. Hi, Farouk. Uh, so um, in classic workflow, let's say you want to check, um, trigger a workflow and you want to check that the parent record field is this or um, you, you, have the, you have a graphic user interface for doing that. So you can, like an advanced find view, so that this field equals that. Yeah. Uh, from uh, is there a simple or user friendly way to do that in flow as well yeah. or do you have to define it using um o data queries or fetch xml so uh you do need to define some of it using o data queries there are, con there are there is actually a condition builder in here um so you, you can add in um all your different conditions and you can add your groupings and things like that into here um, and you can use the dynamic content that's coming out to then do a check condition after you've triggered the flow but if you're coming from a, a dynamics background and you actually want to stop the flow before it starts essentially or, or check to see whether something happens you do still need to do um o data style queries so using the the field schema name for your uh, for your triggers and and stuff um before um uh, and and putting that data in first but uh if you want a great o data tool uh, i can highly recommend the fetch xml builder um i use fetch xml all the time uh, and i tend to go in there uh, if I need to build build out my advanced find, use fetch XML, uh, and then there's a button for uh, Power Automate parameters, and it allows you to actually create the O data if you need it. Um, it. It might not work for what you need, but it might give you a good jumping off point at least um, for it. I don't know O data, so I'm a fish out of water with that one. Thanks. Um, to do. Which will execute first, workflow, power automate, or plugin? Um, that's a good question. Um, there used to be a um, there used to be a, a limit on how often Power Automate would run. So depending on your license, Microsoft have now got rid of the license, so Power Automate should run. In my testing, it's usually anywhere between ten to thirty seconds after it's after a trigger things act happened. Um, but uh, in terms of when things will run, uh, a plugin will probably run first. Um, a, a workflow, depending on whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, um, may run and Power Automate will run as well. Um, but if you're trying to queue those up to see which one, like if you're trying to do something to stop something or, or, or test the speed of it, um, I'm not too sure uh, why you need to know. But Power Automate, uh, will run probably anywhere between 10 to 30 seconds, uh, usually lo usually less than 30 seconds um, when CDS is updated. Uh, a workflow, depending on anything, any number of things um, in terms of your server performance, uh, your environment, that all may change. And, and plugins, I guess, it's depend on how you've configured them in terms of, uh, I guess, sandbox mode and all the things. So sorry, I'm not really a developer, so. I hope that's kind of answered the question. Um, what was uh, right, what was the build name? Yeah, the Fetch XML builder in the external toolbox. Fantastic tool. Jonas Rapp is uh, a legend. You should all go and follow him on Twitter now. Um, but yes, uh, as I said, uh, here here are my details. If you want to come, uh, if you want to join me, uh, I have loads of videos on Power Automate on my YouTube, which is great. Um, I, I love speaking to people as well, so come tell me what you're what you're trying to build. Um, and if there are no other questions, um, I think we'll call it quits there. Um, 
if Trisha wants to. <laughs> Great. Um, thanks, Matt. Um, that was a really, really good and very informative presentation. Um, so I'm going to stop recording now. Um, if you would like to go to the virtual lobby in, in case you